is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are. Crossroads Church. It is great to see all of you here this morning. I'd like to say a special welcome to our first-time visitors, our first-time guests, and invite you to join us in the lobby afterwards for a little bit of refreshment time so we can get to know you better. And for our first-time visitors guests, we'd like to give you a loaf of great harvest bread that we have back there, because here at Crossroads we not only uh, feed the spirit, but we nourish the body as well. If you would, please take a moment to stand up and meet and greet everybody worshiping around you.
We're here to meet with the Lord. Let's worship Him today.
Father, you are worthy. We lift our name up. We give it to you as a sacrifice that you are lifted high in every place. We live for one purpose, and that's to give you glory. Above all else, we thank you. Trample. 
Almighty God, on this chilly January morning, we are truly blessed and excited as we walk outside and see the sun, and we feel the sun on us. But Lord, even more exciting is being filled with your sun, having your sun with us always, reminding us of that attitude that we are to have, that spirit that we are to have, being a Christian. Lord, you remind us when we are driving down the streets and frustrated, being slowed down by a slowpoke in front of us and passed by some fast person beside us, you remind us that we are your children and that your son is with us. When we come home from a frustrated day at work and a job that we just can't stand anymore, you remind us that you are with us. The rod and your staff, they comfort us. When we have fights and arguments with friends and people that we later regret and look back to, you say to us that you will give us compassion, you will give us healing, you give us all that we need, and that you will fill us even in those darkest moments. Lord, through all that we do in our lives, you remind us that you have put us here for a reason, that you have given each and every one of us special, special gifts and talents. You made each and every one of us a difference we each play a different role in your kingdom, Lord. But Lord, of all the things we do during our day, whether it's going to school or going to work or hanging out with friends or just playing at night, being with family, most of all, we are blessed to be your children, to be children of the king. When we get a little angry, a little irritated, a little frustrated, a little cold this time of year, help us to remember that you have a place for us in your house that there is a place for us in your heart. Help us to open up our hearts to be filled by you and your spirit, not just to come in a little bit, not just to give us a thing here or there, but to just fill us up until we are truly overflowing. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for looking after us, even when we don't deserve it. You love us. That incredible truth comes to us always. Thank you, God. Amen. Peace.
For our scripture this morning, we're going to be reading from the book of John, chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 35 through 42. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the twelfth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kepha, which, when translated, is Peter. I've got a picture to show you, if you'd uh, put it up at the screen at this time. Our pastoral intern, also facilities director, Gordon, was married yesterday. Yeah, that's an amen. And so if you did not have the privilege of attending his wedding, um, there's kind of an inside story is that he had his fiance Melissa pack three bags. She packed a bag in case they went someplace cold, like Antarctica or up north somewhere. I don't know if you can get much colder than here. He had to pack a, like a kind of like a, a mid bag for in case they kind of went out west or someplace where they might do some mountain climbing or some hiking. And then they had a tropics bag. And so she did not know until they left for their honeymoon last night which bag would be grabbed. But just to let you know, they did head to the tropics. So he was, yeah, good choice, good choice, Gordon. And I'm not supposed to disclose the location in case anybody would want to go interrupt their honeymoon. So I guaranteed him that I would not share it today so we don't have people with Northwest passes flying down there harassing him or something. We are looking at our series on attitude, and we've been looking at Jesus Christ and his attitude and following the life of Jesus Last week we talked about Jesus and his baptism and how he asked the question, are you worthy? And of course Jesus was worthy to be baptized. Today we're looking at Jesus as he calls his first disciples. And I taught you a phrase last week that we're going to keep doing throughout the series just to kind of remind us of the kind of attitude we need to have. And I say the word attitude check, you say, except you have to say it like you really mean it. So let's try it again. Attitude check. Excellent. And the idea is that when we have our attitude in check, we can't help but want to fellowship with God. We can't help but want to praise the Lord and allow God's word to be indwelled in our heart. I've got a clip art for you. This shows about the attitude of Minnesotans. In this clip art, you'll see them playing ice golf. That's right. The energizing, new exhilarating sport of ice golf. And he's saying there's something about did I hit that maybe 3,500 or 4,000 yards? And to me, I love this because it reminds us of the kind of attitude Minnesotans have. I love Minnesota because even when it's cold like this, we still have a full church. Amen? There's something about Minnesotans that are hardier than the rest of the world. I swear that we have that sense of, you know, no matter what the obstacle, we're going to overcome it. I was talking with someone who was raised down south, and they were at the wedding last night, and they said, why do people even bother to get married at this time of year? <laughs> Is there something wrong with you people? So can't you have like summer and spring weddings like everybody else? And I said, but that's part of who we are as Minnesotans. Is we, we don't let the weather overcome us. We want to make sure that we're out there. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is not loving, letting things overcome us. In fact, Jesus said, and, it, and Paul reiterated, that we are overcomers. We should overcome the world. I brought with you a jar this morning. This is the Marzon Attitude Adjustment Jar. My daughter Becca's nodding her head. Now, Becca, when we use the Attitude Adjustment Jar at the home, why do we use this jar? For like when you mouth off to your parents, you get an attitude adjustment. 
You get to put a quarter or 50 cents in there. What are some other examples of why we use attitude adjustment? In case mom and dad do what? If we're disrespectful to our children or we don't um, uh, give them appropriate attention, we have to put an attitude adjustment in there. If you notice when I'm shaking this, this is not empty. This is the, uh, the way we take offerings um, for our missionaries in Mexico, is every time we make a mistake, if anyone were to, to have an attitude adjustment needed, I was thinking we should carry this in the car with us sometimes, though. Because sometimes we have an attitude adjustment there. And it's a reminder that by putting a quarter in or 50 cents in when we need an attitude adjustment, it helps us remember how it is that we need to better align our life with the life of Jesus. So as a kind of a confessional moment today, I'm going to actually pass this around. And if you've had something this week where perhaps your attitude needs alignment and you have some change in your pocket, just ask God for a little forgiveness. Drop a quarter in here, and I'll be glad to take it down to the... Uh, when we go down to Mexico. He'll wait for you to kind of think about your attitude this morning. I want you to turn to God's Word. If you have your Bible this morning or follow along on the screen, we're going to be looking at the calling of the disciples. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is how our attitude opens our eyes to the reality around us. And if we look at these scriptures, we see how the disciples, and particularly John the Baptist, saw things in a different way because of the fact that they were open to seeing things in a different way. Let's look at God's word. It says, verse 35, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Now remember we talked last week, this is not... The disciple John, this is John the Baptist. And as you recall, he baptized Jesus, then Jesus went off into temptation for 40 days with Satan and is now back again. And now that he's back again, he's coming by and says, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now the term Lamb of God to them would have been known as the Messiah. They would have known that as a, a prophet that proclaimed that the Lamb of God was the Messiah, that the one whose atonement would be coming. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Boom, just like that. Now think about that. John had to see things in a different way. He knew that if he proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God, he may lose some of his disciples. That's sort of like a pastor who has new people come visit his church and they become discipled by him and all of a sudden a better pastor comes in. He says, you know what? Go with that guy. It's not easy to do. He was shepherding these two disciples, and he said, you know what? I know you're following me, but that's the Lamb of God. That's the guy you should be following. And he proclaimed it. Now, I've got a question for you this morning. Are there sometimes times in your life when your eyes are not open to seeing the reality around you? When your vision is somehow clouded by other things? And the thing's just that are happening around you that you should be seeing but somehow are not? I was thinking about that last night. We had actually two weddings take place yesterday. We had one here in the church and then we had Gordon's wedding up in, in, at uh, Forest Hills Church. And I came back late last night and I came in here and this room was actually kind of transformed. If you were here last night for the, the Leverson du Monceau wedding, they had the reception here. And so when I came back in, the chairs were around tables. There was a DJ up on the stage and we were having a dance here. And my first response, I have to be honest with you, was not very positive. I kind of felt like there's people invading our sanctuary. I had this feeling kind of like of, you know, I'm looking up at the cross and I'm looking around here. And I said, this just doesn't feel right. I don't like it somehow. And I was kind of frustrated. And I came in and I sat down. And I got myself, of course, a piece of wedding cake. And as I sat down there eating my wedding cake and looking around the room, my eyes got opened in a different way. Instead of being frustrated or upset, I looked around and I saw the joy for the first time on people's faces. I saw people sitting around having conversations and celebrating as family. I saw the kids up on the stage, including my son Joshua, breakdancing and spinning around on the floor. I saw the kids that were just celebrating the love of family and friends and, and the fact that the Leversons and Dumonceaux are together. And also my eyes got opened and I was able to look around the room in a whole new way and my attitude changed. I think one of the key things that did it for me is I'm blessed each and every Sunday that when I preach, I look in the back and I see the cross. Take a look back there for a second. People don't always look in the back. But, and the cross in the back is a reminder for me of why I stand up front. You guys have the blessing of this cross, I have the blessing of that cross. 
And somehow God checked my attitude last night and said, God, and said to me, Paul, just look at the joy. Don't come in as a judge. Don't come in with your attitude. Come in with and seeing what's happening here. This is a fellowship hall, and fellowship is happening. And all of a sudden, my attitude adjusted, and I was able to praise the Lord. Attitude check. If we follow along in our scriptures, our second thing this morning I want to lift up is that our attitude will help us be open to learning more. In other words, when our attitude is adjusted and we have those new spiritual eyes, God gives us a craving to learn more about Him. That's why once you come to discover God in your life, you want to study His Word. You want to be in a small group fellowship. You want to do a daily quiet time. It's not a have to, it's a get to. And once you get God's Word in your heart, that discovery process deepens. If you look at the scriptures in verse 38, it says, Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Come he replied and you will see so they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him and it was about the tenth hour Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus one of the things I think is great here is first of all is asking questions asking questions is always a good thing so many times in the faith walk, we sometimes are afraid to ask questions. We're afraid to somehow, you know, I'm, you, you come off as stupid and people are going to make fun of you. Or the opposite is the persons like myself who are in charge or leading a Bible study or teaching, we might be offended, tell you not to talk like that. My wife has shared frequently about when she grew up in her Catholic church and she took catechism. She was always the troublemaker because <laughs> she always had her hand up and back and was asking questions. And she said that, you know, that just wasn't acceptable in her church. You're just supposed to memorize things and, and, and kick them back again, not ask questions. One of the phrases that we've talked about how our church is that we are, have open hearts, open minds, and open doors. And I love that about our faith walk at Crossroads Church is that we realize that when you have an open mind and you ask good questions, that just draws you te- deeper to God. Whenever we l- discover the truth, truth will always be uh, something that God can reveal to our hearts. And what these two disciples were doing is they were just trying to figure out who is this Lamb of God? Who is this Jesus? So they went and they followed him. Now think about Jesus for a second. He asked them a question back. Maybe it's the same question I could ask you today. He asked a very basic question. What do you want? Now he saw these two guys kind of following him and he probably knew that they weren't going to mug him. (laughs) He probably knew that they weren't out for trouble. And we talked about this at the worship planning team. Was he like yelling at them? Hey, what do you guys want? Was that more of a quiet question? Um, Excuse me, uh, what are you guys interested in? What do you guys want? I think it was more, he was challenging them to think about why were they following. Jesus already knew why they were following. And so he was saying, what do you want? You're following me for some reason. What do you hope to get out of following me? I'd ask that same question for you. You're here this morning because you want something. You're here this morning because you want to follow Jesus. And you're trailing on behind. But have you ever asked yourself why? What do you want out of Crossroads Church? What do you want from God? What do you want from a relationship with Jesus Christ? Why are you following? What do you want? Jesus wanted them to understand that they were following for a reason because they had something in their heart that they were missing. And he wanted to fill it for them. God has something for your life as well. You need to ask yourself, what do you want? And allow Jesus to fill that in your life. One of the things about attitude is that when we are seeking God, God can help develop that attitude in a more positive way. Zig Ziglar, who is one of my authors I love reading, especially growing up, wrote a book called See You at the Top. And he has a quote I like to look at the screen and follow along with me. It says, the good news is you don't have to buy buy it, which he's referring to as an attitude, but you do have to develop it. In other words, if you have an attitude adjustment needed, you have to develop that attitude adjustment. It doesn't always come naturally. Now, I granted the caribou coffee in the lobby helps on a Sunday morning, and a good cup of coffee in the morning or caffeine kick, Mountain Dew for some of you, I know. That sometimes can help, but that doesn't make or break your attitude. What develops your attitude is daily disciplines 
of day in and day out, asking yourself an attitude check question and reminding yourself of the blessings that God has put in your life and how he's given you the things you need to cope with life. So when life seems overwhelming, you have to ask yourself, why am I so down? Why am I so discouraged? How, would it, how come this is so overwhelming to me when I have the most powerful human or the most powerful being in the world supporting me and encouraging me? And then you have to make that attitude adjustment. One of the ways Jesus does this is he asks a very basic question. He takes them and he says, come follow me, I'll show you where I live. I think knowing where someone is coming from gives us a sense of context. I was just having a conversation with somebody about where I grew up in a small town and they grew up in a small town. And we were talking about that commonality of growing up on a farm early in the morning, days like today, doing chores. And we used to feed our sheep and our cattle and what it felt like to go out to the barn on a Sunday morning and have to do that. Break the hole in the ice and warm it up so they could have something to drink. And we were reminiscing about that context of where we grew up. And sometimes, in order to have an understanding of someone's attitude, you have to know about them. For somebody, they may have been abused growing up. And so they're very sensitive to certain issues. Or they may have had parents that never discussed with them how to deal with family finances, and so finances are always a tough time for them. Whatever context somebody comes from, many times that will determine their attitude. And so when you're dealing with somebody, whether it be at work or school, do you know their context? Do you know enough about them to understand where they're coming from and why? Because so many times we can figure things out that way. We can be more understanding of the context of how we're ministering. And I think the last thing Jesus asked them was this question. Where are you staying? Where are you staying? Why are you following me? And where are you staying? They asked him that. And when they, he didn't just explain, oh, I'm living over there by the Sea of Galilee somewhere. He didn't say that at all. In fact, he said, let me take you to where I'm staying. And he showed them. We talked about this yesterday at our Day of Vision. We had a wonderful celebration. Raise your hand if you were at the Day of Vision yesterday. Quite a few hands going up. That's an annual meeting that we have here at the church and we'll have one again next year in January. And it's the beginning of the year where we as a church kind of claim our mission for the year. And we talk about our, our budget and our salaries and, and staffing and volunteers and we vote in all the leadership of our church. And we spent the day talking about an acrostic called organism. And we discussed yesterday how we're not just an organization but that we're a living organism, growing and multiplying, how we need to reproduce disciples here, we need to grow our small groups. And one of the things we talked about was assimilating newcomers. And I made kind of fun of a few people in the room yesterday and we talked about what it's like if someone comes in who's new, do we greet them? And not only greet them, do we show them where the bread table is and invite them to get a loaf of bread with us? Do we show them where the nursery is if they have a young child or walk them down the hall? Do we show them where the office is or if they need to know where the bathroom is? Do we actually literally walk them or show them? Or do we just hand them a little map and say, welcome to Crosswoods Church? Get a name tag over there. That's what I love about Jesus is he demonstrated how to really show hospitality. And that's to show people and demonstrate his love. So we look ahead to point three here. Our attitude changes for the better when we come into the presence of Jesus. If you follow along in your sermon notes this morning, this is a good one to write down. In that middle section, write that down. Our attitude changes for the better when we come into the presence of Jesus. Beginning verse 41, let's check this out together. It says, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and to tell him, We have found the Messiah. That is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. In this scripture passage, we have a sense of knowing that Jesus saw them. And he named them. And he help them understand that they were going to be in ministry with him. But their attitude had to be open to receiving that. I've got a story I want to share with you that shows the opposite effect. It's kind of the bad attitude. And when we have bad attitudes, they bring bad results. When we have bad attitudes, the negativity begins to form around us. And this is a story I was reading in a, a leadership book that talks about a gentleman who actually lost his job because of his attitude. It says this, I got fired from a job for having a bad attitude. My boss told me that I was doing pretty good work, but my negative attitude made it tough on him and everybody else in my department. I had a few weeks to think about it while I was looking for a job, and my attitude had not helped me at all. 
I'd done the work I was supposed to do and I'd done it as well as anybody else. But instead of recognized for doing good work, I got fired for having a bad attitude. And it was pretty obvious that I needed to change my attitude. In my next job, I promised myself that whatever happened, I would stay positive and I would do my job and I wasn't going to let my attitude get in the way of my job security. I started my new job and the second week I was there, they started downsizing. The only thing I, anybody talked about in the whole place was about how they were going to lose their job, how everybody was getting fired, and where would they get their next job. Maintaining a positive attitude was difficult, but I sat down one night and I wrote down these facts as I knew them. Fact number one, if I have a job and I get fired, I'm no worse off than I was two weeks ago. True? Number two, I'm learning some new skills, so I'm actually better off than I was two weeks ago. Three, if I work hard on my new skills, I'm going to be more valuable to this company or to some other company. Four, sitting around stewing about it isn't going to help me or the company or anybody else. I said after I wrote down those four things, my plan was obvious. I spent several evenings a week working on my programming and computer skills. Every day I went to work with a smile and did my job as best as I could. There was another round of downsizing and this time the president or the CEO of the company got eliminated. The new president came in and gave a speech about cutting expenses and moving the company to California. That, of course, led to more rumors and more negativity. Before the move, I was offered a job with another company, with the former CEO, and he gave me a 20% raise because he observed what a great attitude I had on the job. He goes from having no job to getting eliminated from his job to receiving a 20% pay increase. As he stated, he had to improve his skills, but more importantly, he had to improve his attitude. He had to turn around the way he was thinking and feeling. I think about these disciples that were following Jesus. They were fishermen. They were out there following John the Baptist because they were searching for something. They knew that their attitude had to change and that their ministry had to change, but they didn't know exactly what it was they needed. And then Jesus entered. And he said, guys, come follow me. Hang out with me for a while. And he filled up their lives in such a way that their attitude became more contagious. You see, when we truly come into God's presence, we can't help but want to share the good news. That's the great thing about it, is that when Jesus is a part of our life and we take the time to make a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then our heart and our lives are filled with that so much it becomes overflowing into the world. That's what I love about Crossroads Church is so many of you invite people here to be parts of small groups, to be a part of the ministries here, and I see that your love is contagious. I see the love in this room every time we gather for fellowship and for worship. And it's because people have experienced the love of Jesus Christ. And so if you have a, a bad attitude about something, you have to ask the tough question. Am I in the presence of Christ? Am I truly in God's presence? If I'm a negative person or have negative thoughts a lot, I'd have to challenge you to think about, am I doing a daily quiet time with God? Am I praying to God? Now I'm not just saying that there aren't persons that have um, depression and those need to be medicated or some persons need counseling. I don't want to come off as that, you know, that everything can be solved by reading the Bible every morning. But for many of us, it's those simple little attitude adjustments that we can make each and every day. Attitude check. The last thing I want to point out this morning is about Peter. And Peter, when he came in, he gave him a name. Jesus did. He changed it. And he called him Cephas, which basically translates to steadfastness or rock. And he was reminding, and as he does later on, that Peter will be the cornerstone of the church. He was an ex, basically just giving him a nickname. He was calling him Rocky. This is my buddy Rocky. And now Rocky, or Peter, was really the one that followed Jesus, even during the difficult times. And if you notice, he was Peter, James, and John were those big three that always hung out with him. I've got a question for you this morning. If someone, a friend or family member, were to give you a nickname that reflected your attitude, what would it be? I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I hate it when Pastor Paul makes me do this, or just actually share the question. But what would your nickname be if they were to give you a nickname based on your attitude? A nickname based on your attitude. Go ahead.
Well, you can finish this conversation out in the lobby over a cup of coffee or juice. But I think it's a great question to ask yourself. And sometimes that attitude may not be that positive. And so you may have to ask yourself if you were sharing with your family member or friend and they didn't have a thing to say to you, you may have to ask yourself why. I did this first service and my daughter was sitting next to my wife and she wrote Wonder Deb and uh, <laughs> drew a little poster for her. It says, can lift you away, can teach, can clean the whole house in a whole hour, can detect villainous lies, <laughs> can care, can see right through. She has x-ray vision. And then wrote, it's just plain wonderful. I definitely would have to agree about my wife that way. The second challenge question, and you don't have to answer this one out loud, is what would you like your nickname to be? What would you like people to call you if they were to call you by your attitude? What name do you wish that people would refer to you as? And the last question is, what name would you like Jesus to give you? Do you realize that when you die, Jesus gives you a nickname just like he did with Peter? Do you realize when you open up the Lamb's Book of Life, your name is going to be in there right next to the name that God gave you that's based on your character? It says in the book of Revelations that your name will literally be put on your forehead. The nickname that Jesus gives you will be yours for eternity. When you walk around in heaven for millennium to come, people are going to look on your forehead and recognize the name that Jesus gave you based on your character. Think about that. Let's look at God's word in Revelations 21.1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city... Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and with women, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He goes on to say in 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And on no day will its gates ever be shut. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. 22.3 goes on to say, No longer will there be any curses, the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. Get this. We'll be in the presence and we will see God's face and His name will be on our foreheads. What will be the name that God gives you when you're in the heavenly city? When He says, Servant, well done, and He names you, what character will He exhibit in your life for that name for eternity. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we we're challenged this morning by looking at the calling of the disciples and the naming of Peter. And we think, Lord, about our own calling and how we follow you, how we're called to be fishers of men, how we're called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And in that process, Lord, we know that you are looking at our character. You're looking at our attitude. And you want men that follow Christ-like behavior and women that develop Christ-like attitudes. And so, Lord, we pray for that for our lives, that you will mold us, that you will shape us, that you encourage us to be in your likeness in all that we do. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. We have a wonderful celebration this morning, and I'd like to invite the baptism couple up at this time, along with their sponsors. We just talked about baptism last week and how we do both infant dedications and infant baptisms. And we saw a video last week. Just stand up here, that's fine. And how we do both um, adult baptisms and adult dedications. Yeah. And so we explained how baptism for us as an infant is an act of prevenient grace. It's not an act of salvation, but it's one of the ways that we demonstrate God's love by the parents and by the congregation for raising this child in the Christian faith.
He'll be there for the pictures. Don't worry about it. Yeah. On behalf of Crossroads Church, I ask you now, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you promise to raise this child in the Christian faith? The symbol of the water is a symbol that's been used by God as a, as a form of transformation. God used water when he saved the world through the flood with Noah. He used water at the parting of the Red Sea with Moses. He used the water in the spreading of the Jordan River for the, to enter into the Promised Land. And he used the symbol of water, Jesus himself, when he was baptized in the River Jordan. Gracious and loving God, bless this water as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual presence. And may this water be a holy and living promise that as we place this water on this child, that your love may be, be permeated. I pray for this in your name. Amen. As we discussed the importance of names since the early days, the naming of the child or the naming of the disciple to be baptized has always been an important act of the ritual of faith. And so at this time I ask you, what name giveth you this child this day? McKenna Grace Koch, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What we have is a ritual of faith here, where as we respond um, as a congregation, we'll be walking McKenna out, and she'll be handed off to a member of our congregation as we respond. And the way we do this is so that each of us remember that we have now made this promise to raise this child in the Christian faith. It's not just the parents. It's not just the sponsors. Just like when we have a wedding, we have a public proclamation. We are taking a vow at this time. Let us respond as you read at the screen behind us. Members of the household of faith, I commend you love and care of this child, whom this day we recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that this child may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please, with God's help. Faith, love, and is famished in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Let us now welcome the newest member in the body of Christ. Amanda, that's your cue to have to actually bring the baby back. <laughs> Sometimes that part of the ritual. We just, uh, but this time we'll be moving into receiving our tithes and our offerings. Congratulations. Congratulations. As we receive our tithes and offerings, I'd like to remind persons um, to fill out their stewardship of attendance. You'll notice in the back of our program, there's a little tear-out sheet. This is the time you can tear that out, make that fun noise right now. Rip out that little corner. And as you rip out that little corner, there's a place for you to respond with your name and address. Particularly if anything has changed, like your email or phone number or anything, um, just um, take and fill that out. I'd also ask um, that you take the time um, to have put out any prayer requests or other things that um, you may wish to have put in there as well. And I am, uh, there I am. <clears throat> I was telling Paul Fernside this morning that my, uh, my voice is a little rough, so I decided it would be a good morning to do a Bob Dylan cover. Did everybody hear my guitar? I don't have a monitor up here, so I can't tell if it's coming through or not. Oh, good. Does it sound nice? Good. See, everything can be replaced Yet every distance is not near So I remember every face Of 
of every man who put me here I see my light come shining from the west unto the east any day now oh any day now I shall be released they say every man needs protection they say every man he must fall Yet I swear my reflection Someplace high above it all I see my light come shining From the west unto the east Any day now any day now I shall be released Standing next to me in this lonely crowd There's a man he swears he's not to blame All day long I hear his voice shouting out loud Crying out that he was framed I see my light come shining From the west unto the east Any day now, oh, any day now I shall be I see my light come shining from the west unto the east. Any day now, oh, any day now, I shall. Someone just reported to me that I didn't plan on this being a special offering Sunday. <laughs> that um, the jar got filled up over two times. <laughs> so we have a whole basket full. And actually, some people put fives and tens in. So I don't know what attitude adjustments you guys need out there. <laughs> you can sign up for a counseling appointment later this week. Um, but the, the orphans in Mexico will be definitely appreciative. So that's great. <laughs> Let us please stand. Attitude check. Let us join in a celebration of God's love as we sing together and we send you forth. Gracious and loving God, send us forth with your love. Send us forth with the power of your Holy Spirit to adjust our attitudes, to go and serve you in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen.
this morning. Have a blessed week. If you brought children, please pick them up and then join us in the lobby for fellowship. Have a good week.